thank you again for joining us, everybody. My name is Alex Gordon, and I'm Director of Sales here at ETF Managers Group. I should mention that I am a FINRA registered rep, uh, as well as all of our risk disclosures, prospectus information can be found at our website, etfmg.com. ETFMG is a boutique asset manager with about $5 billion in assets for management, a little more than that. Uh, we specialize in thematic ETFs, uh, which equip investors with the ability to target specific industries uh, or themes really without taking on a single stock risk. Some examples of that are a first to market uh, ETF hack, which allows you to target the cybersecurity industry all under one ticker symbol, iPay, which allows you to target companies revolutionizing the payment market and mobile payments, take on that one's iPay, uh, as well as Away, which allows you to target the travel technology industry. Uh, so today we are here to discuss real estate's uh, digital transformation uh, and a real, real estate technology ETF, HHH is the ticker symbol on this, as well as the index in which this fund tracks. So in a moment, I'm going to be joined by our two guests, Jesse Stein of Every Realm, as well as Chris Monaco of Level ETF Ventures. So Jesse is co-founder and managing director of Every Realm, leading metaverse investor and developer. Jesse previously served as the head of real estate at Republic, an investment platform offering opportunities across startup real estate, uh, crypto metaverse, as well as gaming and music to investors. Uh, and Chris is co-founder and managing director of Level ETF Ventures, which operates Prime Indexes uh, and is partnered on a number of ETF managers' funds, uh, as well as our indexing group as well. So, and, and in fact, uh, does the indexing group for Triple H. So we'll be hearing from him uh, on some of that. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jesse. Thanks, Alex. Uh, hi, I'm Jesse Stein. Uh, I've worked in the real estate industry for about... 20 years and spent the last 10 years uh, specifically working um, for real estate technology companies. And what has always attracted me to the space is really how antiquated the real estate market is. Uh, and because of that, there's a ton of opportunity for um, new companies to come in and try and disrupt that process by creating efficiencies around the real estate transaction. We live in a world today where um, everyone expects um, immediate um, transactions. And in real estate, um, you're looking at an industry that operates very much the same way it did 20, 30 years ago, where transactions take months to close. And the companies uh, within the fund are looking to use technology to create efficiencies uh, in order to bring real estate into the uh, 21st century. So what, what is real estate technology? Um, it also goes by the name PropTech. Uh, you hear that a lot when talking about private companies that are raising venture capital, uh, PropTech VCs or PropTech investment firms. Um, those two terms are synonymous. Uh, the companies in this space uh, are all technology-based companies, meaning that they uh, have built or are building technology um, to help make the real estate transaction efficient. And that real estate transaction um, from start to finish has a lot of different stages in it. So at the very beginning, uh, if you are a brokerage firm, you're out there marketing transactions, but if you're a buyer, you're out there researching um, which properties to buy. And then of course, throughout that real estate transaction, you have the process of financing through a mortgage company, you have due diligence, which includes title assurance, appraisals, um, and then you have the actual processing, which includes things like escrow and closing. And even post acquisition of a property, you have management of a property. The companies within this fund run the gamut um, and are providing technology services that go across this entire transaction, um, all in order to make uh, this transaction more efficient, both from a time perspective as well as from a cost perspective. So in October of last year, uh, ETFMG launched the Real Estate Tech ETF. It is the first um, ETF that provides pure play exposure to uh, a global portfolio of companies um, that are focused on real estate technology. And this is one of the hottest sectors um, 
in the private market, where last year you had a record $10 billion, almost $10 billion put into um, startup companies that were building real estate technology companies. And what's interesting is that a lot of the companies within this fund are relatively new companies. They're not startups, obviously they're public companies, um, but many of them have been formed in the last five, 10, 15 years. And they're still at that stage where they, they are high growth, they are disruptors in the industry. And by investing in the portfolio of these companies, um, you're really investing in the future of real estate and how these companies are going to use technology uh, to disrupt the industry. There are a number of drivers um, that are uh, helping uh, drive growth um, into the use of real estate technology. We're going to focus on four of them, uh, low mortgage rates, um, COVID-19, and of course, how that has impacted the real estate industry, um, remote work policies, and how that has impacted just living in general, and then um, the great wealth transfer um, of uh, funds from the baby boomers to the millennial generation, which of, of course um, has a, a very big impact on many financial markets. So I feel like we've been talking about historically low uh, mortgage rates for a decade plus at this time. And while that may be a driver for increased home prices, um, that's not necessarily um, what really makes a difference for these companies. These companies are transaction-based companies. The more transactions that occur, the better off these companies are. Um, low mortgage rates, um, what, what that does is it, it allows a broader group of um, potential buyers, uh, especially first-time home buyers, to participate in the real estate market. Those first-time home buyers are generally younger more willing to use technology. And then a number of the companies within the fund are financing companies. Um, and the more mortgage volume there is, the better off that these companies do. Last year, uh, more than 90% of home buyers use some form of financing in order to purchase their home. So many of these companies that are focused on disrupting and evolving the mortgage industry um, do benefit from low interest rates. I read an interesting stat the other day um, that pre-pandemic, uh, say pre-March 2020, um, for every virtual tour that uh, someone participated on, in online, there were eight open houses. Um, so the way for people to view houses pre-pandemic was to run around and go to open houses. That ratio today is one to one. So um, one of the things that COVID has expedited is the use of technology for brokers and home buyers in researching and finding a home to buy. Um, as part of that, you had um, a large number of transaction volume that was due to people moving. Um, there was a, an exodus from some of the major cities uh, in 2020 and into 2021. Um, people were more willing to move to the suburbs because they didn't necessarily have the commute that they needed to. And all of this um, Jesse, did we lose you? We continue into 2021. And there's a real desire for the adoption of technology in finding a home to buy. So more, co more COVID related changes um, that, that impact real estate and that's um, the work from home or the hybrid approach. Um, where you know people can work from home some of the time, and you know what that has done is allow people to move to different places 
um, whether it's suburban or even rural, uh, there's no necessity to be in the city uh, next to your office every day. Um, it has um, it has increased the demand for second homes, um, where people can spend three, four day weekends in second homes. Um, and it all has also led to people wanting larger homes because if they're spending more time at home, they want places to work. Um, and you know they want um, you know to be able to live their life at home as opposed to spending eight to ten hours a day in the office. So that's another reason why these companies um, have have benefited from just increased transaction volume and a different type of transaction volume in um, participants using the technologies of these companies to transact. And th this, this is a big one that has been um, you know, occurring pre-COVID. Um, and, and it's really a combination of, of, of a big wealth transfer, trillions of dollars from the baby boom uh, generation to the millennial generation. And what that means is that there's a lot more people that need to buy houses. Um, and, and this, we're at a point where it's not just the millennial generation at this point, it's also Gen Z that are starting to buy houses. So one of the great things about the real estate industry is that it's a necessity product. And there's always going to be a lot of transaction volume in real estate because people have to move and people want to move year over year. You rarely see a period of time um, where there is there aren't millions of houses sold every year. And as the millennial and the Gen Z generation start buying homes, uh, they're much more likely to use technology um, to facilitate that purchase because they have grown up using technology for every aspect of their life. Um, they're more comfortable transacting online, whether it's banking or, or making large purchases, investing, um, that it's natural for them to use technology um, for the home buying process as well. I'll turn it over to Chris now to talk more about the index. Thank you, Jesse. My name is Chris Monaco. I'm the managing partner of Prime Indexes. And as Alex uh, mentioned, we are uh, the index provider for the HHH ETF. And our firm in general creates proprietary indexes. We're a financial publisher uh, that creates indexes for emerging industries. And so industries like real estate technology or prop tech has piqued our interest now for quite a number of months, uh, where we thought even though this industry is, uh, or the real estate industry itself is tracked by quite a number of indexes out there, there was nothing covering what we thought was a major disruption event that was occurring in prop tech or real estate tech. So the index that we created, in our opinion, is truly first of its kind. And we believe that many investors out there now are familiar with uh, literally hundreds of indexes that track the real estate industry in some manner. And many of you are familiar with real estate investment trusts, or of course, home builders, as well as even the commodities that go into home building, such as lumber, and then also real estate prices. So there are indexes that that in some way uh, slice and dice the real estate market or some aspect of it. Uh, and indeed, there are over 30 exchange traded products in the US with assets of over $80 billion in each of these areas, whether it is REITs or it's home builders, what have you. But there was no index that was used as the benchmark for prop tech. And so that's what we're talking about today. So this is truly a first of its kind index and it's a pure play exposure and, and we'll talk a little bit about why that's the case but it's also a global phenomenon right people talk about prop tech and i think they think of the the companies that they are using themselves i mean who hasn't been on on zillow or redfin or others or airbnb uh, but it's actually occurring all over the the planet and what we'll show is that there are companies that are not only listed in other countries, but they operate globally as well. And then as Jesse pointed out, the unique industry growth drivers, such as low interest rates, such as adoption of technology, and even if some of those 
uh, those drivers start to fade a little bit. What it has happened over the past few years is that the, the adoption rate among either real estate investors or homeowners, home buyers, property owners, as well as real estate professionals has increased dramatically. And it's something that we believe will not fade over time. If anything, what has happened is that because the trajectory has increased, it would probably continue to accelerate as well. An interesting stat that I saw uh, the other day from a market report was that in 2021 alone, which Jesse mentioned a, a stellar year from a prop tech investment perspective, but looking at the prior decade, there were only roughly 2,000 prop tech companies, whereas now there are roughly 8,000 prop tech companies. They're not all, of course, publicly listed, and many of them are very, very, very tiny, most likely in incubation phase. Nevertheless, what it's showing is that there's certainly interest in this massive disruption opportunity and likely a steady stream of potential components for years to come that will be evaluated for entry or inclusion in the index. So let's talk about how we define the prop tech industry, the real estate tech industry. Because at the end of the day, there's a formal definition that we adhere to when making a decision of whether a company should be included or not. And some of those are very quantitatively driven, some of them uh, based on certain qualitative factors, for example, the definition that you're seeing on the slide right now. But it can basically, basically be split into two categories. The first category you could think of as more business to consumer or, or consumer facing. So think of the Airbnbs of the world or the the Zills of the world, where the average ordinary user can just log in and either look for properties that it wants to rent or is interested in purchasing or perhaps looking for a free evaluation of what they think their property is worth. But then the other category is more of the B2B category. So think of companies that are providing software and full stack services to real estate professionals or perhaps to other companies that, are, that need data and analytics for their real estate holdings. And what we'll get into when we look at some of the holdings is, is how there is a very equitable split between those two types of categories. One thing I just would like to bring up also is the, the, the way we actually structure the index. There's a fair amount of research that goes into screening for the companies and eventually coming to the final portfolio. I'll talk very high level about what it is we do in the process there, but essentially it starts with a screen of literally tens of thousands of global securities. And then we slowly whittle down the list to filter out companies that are either unlisted securities, or perhaps are listed only in emerging markets or frontier markets, or perhaps in countries or jurisdictions where there are some restrictions regarding foreign investment. So the goal is to make the benchmark as investable as possible. The next step is that we look at certain liquidity factors and market cap requirements. And I won't go into all of them, but suffice to say that, again, with the goal of being an investable benchmark, we're looking at companies that achieve a certain market capitalization level, as well as a certain level of liquidity as we measure it in average daily value traded. And after we whittle down the list into a population of most likely several hundred companies, we further screen the financial statements and marketing material of those companies to ensure that they are engaged in the relevant business activity as we define them right here in these two, these two definitions. The end result is the composition that we'll get into in a little bit. Next. Now, Jesse uh, brought up a few of the subsectors in the real estate industry, and you could see just the enormity of the disruption opportunity here. And, and these are just uh, some of the largest ones, but there are many companies that are engaged in multiple areas. When people think about home insurance, right, they're thinking about uh, HIPAA or Lemonade. When they're thinking about brokerage, boy, there's quite a number of companies there that are not only engaged in providing listings, but also uh, drifting or expanding into the brokerage space. All in all, this is roughly, just looking at these categories, roughly $350 billion market opportunity. That's the size of each of the areas that 
we believe the index represents. And truly a massive opportunity and ones where it's hard to quantify the market size, for example, of escrow and closing services, but it also allows for expansion of those businesses too, and, and allows for new entrants to, to expand their, their business and new entrants that are not necessarily prop tech players, they're real estate professionals, but they're able to use the services of prop tech companies to expand the services that they can engage in and also compete with entrenched competition. Next. Okay, so a lot of the companies here, uh, I think everybody is familiar with, you know, the Zillows of the world, uh, as well as Redfin's and others. And these are the companies that are engaged in that primary B2C or consumer facing business. Companies that operate listing services and they cater to agents and others as well as to homeowners that are looking to establish a valuation on properties they're contemplating selling. But when you look at this list, the, the, a couple of the selling points I'd like to bring up here, not only the diversification and the types of activities that they're engaged in, again, that difference between consumer facing and B2B, but also the geographical distribution of some of these companies and the listings that are included here. So Zillow and KE Holdings, for example, uh, have similar businesses. They don't overlap directly, but the difference here is that you know, Zillow is predominantly in the US, whereas KE Holdings is predominantly in China. It's a China-based company that has its shares listed in the US. So it's global in other ways. And then we go further down the list and we look at CoStar and Black Knight. Black Knight, very interesting company because it is basically catering to real estate professionals. This is more of a B2B play. So Black Knight, when you, when you think of their, uh, uh, their business operation, right? It's a software data and analytics company that's focusing on mortgage lending and servicing, not involved so much in the online marketplaces and listings that we think about every day, but still very much a prop, prop tech company. In this list, we see quite a number of names just in the top 10 that are not US listed or their shares may be listed in the US, but they're actually working or, or focused mostly on overseas operations. So I, I mentioned KE Holdings in here. There's also REA Group, which is listed in Australia and derives a fair amount of its revenue from the Australian market, but nevertheless has operations all around the world. And then you take Scout 24 and Right Move. Scout 24, a German player, and Right Move uh, serves mostly the UK market. So there's a combination of not only different types of businesses and different types of aspects of prop tech, but also different parts of the world demonstrating that it really is a global phenomenon. Next. And this is evidenced by the distribution of the, the entire index portfolio. So there's roughly 36 names in the index now. About two thirds of it are US based or US listed. Uh, but when you think about their, where they derive their revenue, it's actually much more diverse than this. And so this is the best estimate that one can come up with regarding the revenue, I'm sorry, the geographical diversification of the components. I mentioned KE Holdings in China, but there's also REA Group in Australia, very interesting company that has assets all across uh, the world. But there are also local players. And when you think of the, the Zillows of the world, if you will, but also just beyond listings, you could think of uh, those same companies that exist in every jurisdiction, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Australia or Asia or elsewhere, they exist around the world. But right now the composition is such that there's roughly, <clears throat> even though I said two thirds of the companies are represented in the US, uh, there are still exposure to nine countries, which is significant. Next. Oh, but first actually before we, I thought there was one more slide there. So I apologize. Um, I, I would like to just briefly mention that um, uh, when I talked about investments, previously and the growth of the number of companies coming to market, even though, you know, this shows about 69%, you know, we'll call it two thirds because it changes on a day-to-day -day basis, 
as being US-based, we're seeing a lot more companies that haven't yet reached the requirements necessary for inclusion into the index, but are certainly on our radar and on the cusp of inclusion. So we expect the geographic diversification to actually increase significantly because again, as we, as we point out, much like almost every other business has become uh, digitized, uh, we think the real estate industry is becoming digitized as well. And this is happening in every major marketplace around the globe. Alex, I'll turn it over to you for now to see if there's any, any Q&A from the audience. Sure. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with just a few questions that um, tend to be the most common ones we get from investors. Um, so we'll kind of toss them out there that, you know, if either of you wanted to answer, but uh, for those listening in, feel free to use the Q&A function on top there. We have had a few come in already, um, but feel free to use that Q&A function and we'll, we'll get to them uh, momentarily. Um, first question, which I think you guys each sort of answered in your own way here, one from the practitioner side and one from the indexing defining universe side, but we can kind of bleed in with the two with the second question, which is really how has tech infiltrated uh, the real estate industry and, and how, and, you know, you define prop tech before you define kind of what makes into the universe here from an indexing world here, but um, you know, how, what, what have you seen uh, as far as uh, real estate, um, you know, again, receiving this attention here at attention from the tech industry? You know, over the past say five, 10 years, I think you've seen um, significant movement towards a more efficient real estate transaction. And it's mostly um, through the implementation of online technologies. Um, you know, if you if you say start at the beginning, just researching um, and finding a home to buy, um, being able to use the online listing aggregators um, and, and not only to find an address that makes sense, but also the amount of information that's provided on, on a Zillow. Um, and then being able to do a virtual tour on Zillow as opposed to relying on pictures um, or having to go see the house um, for, for your first view. And then where a lot of um, disruption has taken place is in the financing, where rather than going to a traditional bank, you do have um, more technology focused companies like a rocket mortgage that are really trying to um, make the financing process less complex for a borrower, quicker, um, so that it doesn't take two to three months to close on a transaction, it could potentially take, you know, a couple of weeks. Uh, I know Rocket tries to get, um, you know, pre-approval letters out without, within a number of days so that buyers know exactly what they can afford. Um, and then on the other side of the transaction, um, when it comes to you know, closing um, and moving in and managing that property, um, on the commercial side, you have a, a lot of um, technology solutions that have uh, made it easier for landlords um, to manage properties. Um, so there has been significant pro progress. I do think there's still a ton of room for disruption and for more efficiency in the space. And, and that's really why I think, you know, the companies in this fund have, have an opportunity that's still available um, and hasn't, you know, already occurred. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that as well. When I uh, think about the first phase of, of PropTech, when a lot of the listing services first started, and uh, you can search for any property. You can do research on what you believe to be the valuation of your own property. But then after that, uh, people would simply walk into a brick and mortar brokerage and start to conduct business. And so what's happened is the entire process from, from start to finish has become, uh, has become more digital. And whether it's virtual tours, but also e-signing, for example, or property management automation, even real estate investment crowdfunding. So every aspect of it from start to finish is being disrupted. And a lot of the companies in the index may focus on very specific parts of that process. And some of them may actually focus on multiple parts of it because it is part of the same transaction. When you think about many of you, I'm sure, have, have been to a real estate closing, but the process of getting to that closing involves sometimes six to eight different parties or companies. And when you wind up at that closing 
and you see a number of people in the room and and i'm sure a, a lot of people are still bewildered well why why does there need to be so many people in this room and that's partly the the value proposition here is that in, even though even though some of these companies still need to be involved, do you necessarily have to all congregate in a room to sign all these documents and to verify certain things that could have all been done either automatically or almost in real time online. So, so again, it's, it's amazing to see how much of the entire process from start to finish has become digitized and we think that that this presents an enormous opportunity in, in what we mentioned before, roughly $350 billion marketplace for each of these areas. Okay, so we discussed a lot of very powerful growth drivers, um, and clearly there's, there have been a few that have been taking place over a number of years and are still unfolding here. Uh, I guess the question really is, you know, and, and some investors maybe think they missed the boat to some degree. Um, you know, I know my friends that are still shopping for houses, wait for 15 people to go into an open house right now. So from their perspective, I don't think that much of uh, the real estate market has receded yet. But, you know, do we see uh, those growth drivers, you know, receding in, in, in any way here? And, and, and I guess on top of that here, how does the tech side of things, um, I guess, give you a differentiated exposure to maybe some of the other real estate parts of the market? I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, I think the biggest growth driver for real estate technology is, is really um, just the, the transition to uh, millennial and Gen Z participants um, in the market as opposed to the older generation. And, you know, th these, these groups of people are used to transacting online. They do all of their financial um, livelihood uh, functions online um, and buying real estate, you know, is not going to be any different for them. They, they trust online transaction. They trust technology. Um, I don't think um, it's going to be too long before, you know, clicking to buy a house or clicking to sell a house is going to be a norm. Um, you know, you look at a company like Opendoor um, where they're disrupting the brokerage model in a different way than some of the brokerage firms um, in the index where they are serving as the counterparty on each transaction. They're buying houses on their own balance sheet as a buyer, and then they're selling them as a seller. And you can do the entire transaction online from start to finish in a matter of days through open door, either as a buyer or as a seller. And that sounds a little bit crazy to a lot of people because, you know, you're really going to buy a three, four hundred thousand dollar house online by clicking a button. Um, but I do think the younger generation of people um, are more comfortable doing so. Um, and as, say, the financing companies kind of catch up with some of the innovations on the transaction process, you will be able to finance equally as quickly. Um, and buying a house, you know, will be similar to, you know, buying something on Amazon. Yeah. Well, that's exactly the point I wanted to make as well regarding uh, the, the adoption rate having been accelerated, not only because of this massive shift in home buyers with uh, the millennial uh, generation coming of age to, to be the predominant home buyers for the next few years, uh, but also just the, the fact that even older generations uh, have begun doing any ordinary purchasing online. Now, of course, buying a property, selling a property is much more significant. Nevertheless, becoming accustomed to some of these transactions, at least beginning online, is something that I think has changed the overall growth trajectory of uh, adoption for these technologies. And regardless of what happens with interest rates, I think that will that will certainly continue. I'm not sure anybody is feeling that you know now that you know whether uh, COVID-19 has the risks have receded in some way, they feel that they absolutely want to begin their search by walking into uh, a broker. I think a lot of people will still continue the trend of looking for things online, evaluating properties online, doing virtual tours online. And a lot of those different components are represented in the index uh, one way or another by certain companies. Okay. So Opendoor is a really interesting company and uh, gets us really nice to our next question about some holdings in HHH. I think you touched on a few before, obviously 
Um, you know, Zillow and Rocket are, are pretty uh, are pretty household names here in the space here, and certainly do a lot of advertising on the consumer side. Um, but you know, can you touch on a few other holdings, some of the other technologies that they may be involved with that aren't aren't as familiar with the rest of uh, the investor base? And just a, a, another quick you know side question here. Maybe this is more more in, in Jesse's uh, realm, but um, you know, what about the pipeline, what about companies that are maybe either in the venture stage or, or still just going through kind of the private, uh, you know, process of, of getting onto the IPO eventually here, maybe being included in, in the HHH fund at some point, but are you seeing anything interesting in the private world, um, you know, that really stands out? Chris, why don't you take the first half of that? Sure. Yeah, I'll start with, you know, a company that I mentioned briefly before, so Black Knight, a very interesting company, right? And its focus is on software data and analytics for mortgage lending and servicing. And there are a number of companies that are that are in that space where they're maybe not be focusing only on mortgage lending and servicing, but nevertheless, they're providing technology in some way. Compass is another one. Uh, Compass is a real estate technology company, but it focuses on servicing agents, for example. Uh, there's a number of companies also that focus on property management, automation for property owners. And I think of smart rent, for example. So there are quite a number of companies that the, the average investor may not be familiar with because they're not in the real estate industry. They're still, of course, looking at properties on, on Zillow and other listing services, Redfin and elsewhere, or perhaps getting quotes from Lemonade for, for their property. But they're not they're not familiar with the B2B companies, the ones that are enabling some of the existing players that you know, they're not going to be put out of business by, uh, by a lot of these companies, but nevertheless, they know they need to adopt and they know they need to become more digital in how they conduct their business. And a lot of the companies in the index are servicing them. They're enabling those, those companies, whether they're brokers or others, uh, to become more connected to the younger generation that has clearly expressed interest in uh, beginning their search and conducting as much of their business online as they can. And then with, with respect to, you know, private companies that may ultimately become public um, and join the index, um, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that a number of the companies in the index recently did go public. Um, you had, you know, what was an IPO slash SPAC boom um, over the last 18 months or so. So many of the large um, VC-backed private real estate technology companies have gone public and a number of those are, are, are already in the index. Um, you know, what, one, one type of company that I would love to see ultimately go public um, and, and be part of the index is uh, on the real estate crowdfunding side. Um, and a lot of the private real estate companies that I follow are involved in real estate investment and really um, making real estate investment, whether it's buying uh, a rental house um, and um, owning that uh, on your own, um, you know, without having to deal with a lot of the hassles or participating in a syndicate um, to, to invest in, in any kind of, of real estate, really. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to, to one of those private companies growing to the point where they can go public and, and ultimately, um, you know, be part of the index. Very interesting. <clears throat> Okay, so next question, and this is uh, again probably more in, in, in Jesse's court here, and, and um, you know a little bit more involvement of your day job. But what do you see as far as growth in the virtual real estate sector? There's a few companies within this index that have sort of dipped their toe in the water, but certainly wouldn't call it their their primary business at all. Um, but at the same time, here that's something we get questions about quite a bit, especially as it relates to any metaverse real estate things along those lines. Um, you know, what what thoughts can you offer there? I, I, th I thought I might go a whole hour without talking about the metaverse, but um, right. uh, you know, at, at, at every realm, uh, I run uh, our virtual real estate fund. And what I find interesting about it is that there are a lot of similarities with virtual real estate and real world real estate. Um, I mean, some of the major differences are obvious. You don't build physical property, you build uh, in code. Um, but from an economic perspective, the use cases for virtual real estate are very similar. You can lease it to a third party, you can operate a business, um, or you can hold for, for future appreciation. 
And we've seen a lot of the service providers, you know, not the specific companies, but those services that exist in the real world also make their way into the virtual real estate world. You do have um, brokers. Um, you do have data providers that are um, aggregating listings um, so that it is easier to uh, find a property to buy. Um, you have financing companies. Uh, they're not called mortgages, but they are providing loans on virtual real estate. And we've had a, a number of conversations with uh, some of the companies in this index, as well as other public and large companies about how they may make their way into the metaverse. Um, it's despite all of the press uh, that it may be getting, it's still a very small industry as a whole. So it may not make sense for a lot of companies to jump in in a big way at this time. I know a lot of companies are kind of keeping an eye on it to see when is the right time to, to jump in. Um, but companies you know, that provide data or listing aggregation or financing could all play a role um, in the metaverse. And, and then I think the real obvious one uh, within the index is Matterport, um, which provides uh, virtual representations of uh, real world property. They basically do what people are doing in the metaverse already, um, primarily for virtual tours or for um, anyone that you know wants to be able to show off a physical space in, in, in 3D virtual aspects. So I'm sure they've been having internal conversations about how they may play in the space. And I think if they did want to um, jump into the metaverse, they would be a significant player right off the bat. Interesting, okay. Yeah, certainly certainly questions that uh, come up quite often about that. Um, so certainly, and, and, and this is, you know, again, the, the, the final way to try and kind of tie this up here. Fitting into a portfolio, um, I think we, you touched on something before here, HHH is comprised of a lot of companies that have either gotten recently public through a SPAC or an IPO, so definitely would be kind of cast in that growth realm and certainly have been experiencing some volatility lately, um, probably less so than maybe some of their, you know, other real estate brethren in the, in the REIT world. Um, so, you know, maybe ask from the perspective of fitting alongside something like REITs in a real estate bucket, does, does something like that make sense, um, you know, Chris? And, and, you know, again, I, I realize, you know, we're talking on an index, index level. Um, but broadly speaking here, does something like that make sense? Yeah, I think that uh, people that are interested in real estate uh, you know, have exposure by way of REITs, uh, have exposure by way of home builders, and it's a very different type of exposure. You know, this is more a, a focus on high growth. So if you're a believer in the growth of real estate or at least steady streams of income, for example, in the case of uh, in the case of REITs, this is just a different aspect of the real estate industry. And it's a unique one because it's covering this growth equity uh, technology space. So you know, when you think of uh, investors that have interest in, say, broadly technology, yet hive off some of their investment to allocate to a, a growing uh, area or emerging trend, uh, this is a very similar type of investment. And I think we discussed a little bit ago about the number of companies that have gone public. I think in, in 2021, there were roughly six components uh, of the index that, that went public. And then the year prior in 2020, uh, there were eight, which, um, which shows not only the growth of the industry, but, but of course also the willingness among investors to, to buy the shares of those companies. So you know, clearly there's interest in real estate because it's a massive industry. And, and a different type of interest compared to what traditionally has been, you know, simply just REIT investment or, or home builder investment. Okay. Um, so that sort of melts into this, this next question here, and you, you partially answered this before, but, um, you know, again, just broadly speaking, we see so many great talking points about what, how the housing market has been very strong. Um, but, you know, a lot of these names here within the portfolio have not exactly reflected that. Now, HHH hasn't been out for that long. And, uh, you know, again, it's been sort of launched into a pretty volatile period, especially for the newer companies. But, um, you know, do we, uh, I, I guess, you know, why, why do we think that maybe some that hasn't followed suit? Is it, is it purely just a, a growth, um, you know, volatile kind of tech sell off here? Yeah, it's, it's it's certainly we've we've approached a period of accentuated short-term volatility, and that's never a great thing for uh, for high growth equity just in general. And and you know uh, this is an index that 
that um, uh, that fits in the same category. Nevertheless, uh, you know the benefits of of an index and then eventually an ETF that uh, that uses an index is that you're 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 basically getting diversification across all of the players. So when a lot of people think about a specific company that they want to invest in, uh, sometimes it's part of the their broader interest in the theme or the emerging industry. It's not so much uh, perhaps uh, that's the one company that I want, but I believe in this category. I'm a user of this business or this service, or I believe in and how these companies are disrupting an existing market. And I think this fits in well with that, with that thinking because you know, ETFs, in my personal opinion, are, are stock replacements. They're single stock replacements. You, you can have exposure to a specific theme in one, in one ticker symbol. And if you're a believer or if you have interest in any one company, well, there could be probably 30 to 40 others that fit in the same category and that's the uh, the value of of having a global benchmark is that you could track the companies in this industry and it's done in a way that that represents not only the geographic diversification that truly exists but also the the reality of of the investability of the space um, as well as the sizes of those of those companies and liquidity and everything else so it's you know in my opinion, um, yeah, there's been some some volatility, but you know that's the benefit of an index, and that's the benefit of a financial product that is using that index. Is you get that exposure to dozens of companies in different jurisdictions and different growth drivers. And just just to add to that, you know what what the ETF does enable is for an investor to take a position that the real estate industry, which is obviously huge um you know is currently antiquated and will get disrupted um and if so rather than having to bet on a specific company that will do so bet on a portfolio of companies that are um have put themselves in a position through technology to be those disruptors interesting okay so there was a, an interesting page before we saw the sort of the geographic breakout but can we maybe touch on some of the international stories that um you know, come up within the prop tech industry and, and how global the story really is. I mean, it seems like some of these companies may also make for better connectivity uh, between countries on kind of the real estate front as well. So, um, you know, what, what do we see internationally and, and, and how is that going to play out? Yeah, I mean, certainly the, there's quite a number of listings in the U.S., but it doesn't necessarily mean that those U.S. listings are driving most of their revenue or only their revenue from from the U.S. marketplace. Indeed, a lot of them are are global players, and that's simply because real estate is a it is a global industry. The same home buyer that's going through a a transaction in the U.S. is also going through very very similar types of processes in in Europe or Australia or in China. I mean, there there's so much documentation. There are so many parties involved, and they may be called different things or maybe bundled a little bit differently. Nevertheless they're still going through them. And so a lot of the companies in the index that even though they may be listed on any one particular exchange, they may be headquartered elsewhere, representing their, you know, perhaps the, uh, the true exposure that they're getting to a local market, or they're just operating in multiple continents. And one of the companies that I think about is uh, an Australian listing. It's um, REA Group, very interesting company. And so broadly, it's a digital business focused on, on real estate. And some people may call it you know, the Zillow of, of Australia, but nevertheless, it extends far beyond that. It has interests that are throughout Asia and Europe and, and even in the US. And you know, many people have heard of the website realtor.com, whose parent company is Move, and REA has a 20% stake in move that operates realtor.com. So, you know, it's certainly a global presence story, but even beyond just simple listings, you know, that's also a company that has strategic investments in end to end platforms, uh, for example, for real estate transactions or digital mortgage applications. So, all of the things that home buyers and sellers are going through in the US, they're going through those same things elsewhere. And you have companies like this, like, for example, REA Group that has a footprint in almost every uh, continent. Okay. 
So I guess the last question that we really have here is just when we kind of around the index, um, you know, as, as far as composition, I think you kind of gave us a pretty good idea before about what actually are some of the, the, the keywords and, and things that you're looking for that, that end up, um, you know, with companies in the index, but how often does the fund rebalance and is there any, you know, can we find more information here in your site? Is there, is there more stuff that uh, the prime has available for this fund? Oh yes, yeah. so there's there's quite a bit of work that goes into not only the construction of the index but the ongoing maintenance and operation of it. And primeindexes.com is the website where you can find information regarding the composition, as well as where the index is distributed on certain market data platforms, research covering the industry as well. But speaking at a high level regarding the formal methodology that we we have developed for for running and operating the index. Uh, the index reconstitutes on a quarterly basis. So every March, June, September, December, you can think about the process that I mentioned previously where the index is basically rebuilt from the ground up performing those screens at each of those times throughout the year. And the goal there is to ensure that not only is the index uh, relevant and we're capturing all of the companies that may have gone public in the intervening time, but also ones that have may moved in a direction to, to perhaps make them eligible for inclusion, even though they were listed or IPO'd one or two years uh, before. So the process is a very thorough one. It's an ongoing uh, process. Um, and and you know, four times of the year, there's this formal uh, reestablishment or realigning of, of the index that occurs called the reconstitution process. Seems like that was the last of our questions. So I want to thank everyone for taking the time with us today. Uh, I want to thank Chris and Jesse for joining us. And again, if you have any questions on the fund itself, etfmg.com, you can find the prospectus, fact sheet, et cetera, uh, for HHH, as well as the rest of our funds. So thank you very much again, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Thanks, Al. Thanks, everyone.